Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Dench, and I'm going to... Oh, that's a good picture of me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the hope and the hype of CRISPR. Uh, so imagine our genome is a bit of a dumpster fire of information. Imagine you went to Ikea and bought 20,000 things, each thing representing a different protein coding gene in the human genome. Uh, you got home, you dumped all the parts onto your living room floor, and then you burnt the instructions. Uh, so you've got a lot of Allen wrenches and not any real clear direction on how to put everything together. And looking at our genome is exactly like that. It's the product of three and a half billion years of short-term thinking. Uh, imagine you're a, a, a computer programmer and every single line of code you've written, uh, whether it's for Perl or Python or R or whatever, is all in one text document. Uh, and it needs to run every single function you, you've ever written. Uh, that's kind of what our genome is like. Uh, so at the end of the Human Genome Project, we've got three billion bases of this. Uh, and, you know, you just look at it and, it, and it's not terribly informative. And, you know, at the end of a billion years and 15 years, Eric Lander was asked to summarize the Human Genome Project in seven words, and he said, Genome bought the book hard to read, and unlike assembly and IKEA furniture, you can't just call up helpful Swedish people uh, to get any sense of direction. So how do we determine function? How do we, how do we determine what are the parts list of our human genome, and how does dysfunction in our genome lead to disease? So the classical way of doing this is reverse genetics. Uh, you start with a phenotype. It could be a fly with white eyes. It could be a cancer predisposition that runs in a family. And then you map backwards to find the gene that is, that is causative for that phenotype, a great example uh, being the BRCA gene uh, for breast cancer uh, susceptibility. But now that we have the sequence of the human genome, we want to start with the sequence of the gene and determine the phenotype. So how do we go about creating mutants in cells in order to determine, well, what does that gene do? Well, that's something that CRISPR is really, really good at. Uh, it's a great tool for making mutants and understanding the functions of genes uh, at very large scale. Uh, so what's shown here is a schematic of really a bread and butter technology uh, at the Broad and many labs around the world uh, called pooled screening. Uh, the great part about this technology, and I could talk about this for hours, uh, I won't. Uh, but the great part about this technology is that you don't need a lot of infrastructure to run it. This is a technology that essentially any lab around the world uh, can order our libraries from AdGene, take it into their particular infrastructure. You don't need robotics. You don't need fancy equipment. You can just do these sorts of screens to ask sort of any question you want about what are the functions of genes in any sort of area of biology. Uh, this is the scientist way of showing, hey, look, we've been productive. Uh, screenshots of papers. Uh, but I think one thing that's very important to note is that it's across a lot of different areas of biology. We've been looking at uh, questions of infectious disease, uh, about enhancing immunotherapy, about enhancing cancer therapy, uh, really all sorts of different areas, and not nearly all of these papers are by us. Uh, this is meant to illustrate how broadly used this technique is of determining gene function at scale, uh, really uh, around the world. And it's really CRISPR that has enabled uh, the ability for, of us to do this. Uh, so, and the other great part about Cas9 is, is you know, we, we can make mutants by, by knocking out DNA, but it's a very versatile enzyme. I think you've seen that uh, with a lot of the, the, the uh, lightning talks from yesterday as well, uh, that you can tether on a lot of different things to Cas9 and not use it only to knock out genes, but to perturb genetic information in lots of different ways. It really is a Swiss army knife of activities. And that's really important because in order to do functional genomics, uh, you need to perturb cells, but you also need models and assays. And whether you're using CRISPR, CRISPR is great, uh, but you could be using magic fairy dust. And if your model isn't reporting on the right biology, if you don't have a good model for how the immune system functions, if you don't have a good model for how people develop diabetes, it doesn't matter what perturbation you're using. So it's really standing on the, on the shoulders of great models and great assays that we can really use CRISPR in the lab today to understand what our genome is telling us. Uh, if you've bothered to spend uh, years of your, of your postdoc or your, or your graduate career building good models, you should do a lot of screens. There's a lot of technologies out there, some involving CRISPR, some using previous technologies, and every time you do a screen, you're going to learn something new. There's a lot of different ways of looking at biology, a lot of different ways of perturbing our genome, uh, and we, we do learn thing, new things each time. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd just like to point out that we've kind of been here before with genomic technologies. Uh, so here's something from, from Nature Reviews, that the c capability to quickly and efficiently alter any gene sequence while profound impacts on biological research. That is true, but that was written about Talon technology in 2013. Uh, Fortune magazine said within a few years this technology should yield a rough idea of what each of our genes does. That was completely wrong. Uh, it's, that was in 2003 about RNAi. We still don't know what most of our genes do. And some people may have noticed the battle of biblical proportions over the patents for a crucial enzyme in molecular biology. Uh, that's actually from 1996 about TAC polymerase. So we've been here before. 
Uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone in the genetic perturbation platform at the Broad. It's a, it's a very fun group of people, and we're really, uh, and this is something that, that is really at the founding of the Broad, we're into the idea of doing team science, uh, the idea of making tools that are scalable and distributable and democratizable that everyone around the world can use. Uh, and, and in the words of IKEA language, uh, you know, don't do it by yourself. Do, do it with a friend. Uh, and back when we had a president who was worth quoting, uh, you know, it was amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Thank you very much.